other other cases of that. Sounds like the of Cordon graphs. Yes, P PDO is equivalent to Cordon. So, so what is that saying that about Cordon graphs? Yeah, so it's saying exactly the same thing. PDO, P, this is saying, but it's saying more because you need to you need to specify. Remember, this guy depends upon the ordering. So if you have a Cordon graph, then it has a PEO. And if you, if you put the numbers on the graph in the order of the PEO, then you get the equality. That's what it's saying for Cordon. I am missing what happened if the graph is not Cordon. If it's not Cordon, this, this equality is Oh, but if, it, if it's not Cordon, then you're in this case. If it's not Cordon, then if you expand the chromatic polynomial, the coefficients of the chromatic <coughs> polynomial bound above the number of forests. Yes. They're not. Other questions? Yes? Can every graph be labeled in such a way that it is? No. That was my next great, oh, okay. great leading question. I'll pay you later. Uh, no. A graph G may have no PEO or multiple PEOs. So having a PEO isn't there's no uniqueness around. You can have zero, one, many. You can have n factorial PEOs if some trim So yeah, you can have as few or as many PEOs as you like. Other questions? Okay, so some of you may be wondering, well, I put up Jeremy Martin's name in the top. Where did he come in? Well, what happened was uh, Josh was at FIPSAC this past summer giving him a poster on his work, and Jeremy Martin came by. Jeremy Martin is an e absolute expert at taking um, theorems from graph theory and generalizing them to simplicial complexes, to higher dimensions. So Jeremy said, this is, this, we should look at this for higher dimensions, and lo and behold, we got results. So let me tell you in the last 18 minutes, I think, what give you at least a sense of what we did for arbitrary symmetry. So, and I'm not assuming that people know a lot about simplicial complexes here. So, <coughs> those of you that are experts, I apologize for going at a slow pace at this point. You can go to sleep for the next five minutes as long as you don't snore. Okay, so, I make the wood. Yes, exactly. So, so, let V be a set of vertices. Actually, it can be an arbitrary set, but we're going to think of them as vertices. <coughs> so then a simplicial complex on V is a family delta, so we'll be using delta for simplicial complexes, of subsets of the vertex set. And the thing that makes it a simplicial complex is that, oh, if I take an element sigma in V, and I take any subset of it, sorry, sigma in delta, then that subset must also be in delta. So it's a set of subsets of V that's closed under taking subsets. Or if you like to think in terms of Boolean algebras, it's a lower order ideal in the Boolean algebra on V, whichever algebra you want to think. These things are called faces, the elements in delta. So again, an example is worth a thousand definitions. Give you one more. So V could be, say, the numbers from one to four, and delta could be the following set of Right? So for example, you 
to check. One, two, four is in here, and all of the subsets are, right? One, two is in here, <coughs> one, four is in there, two, four is in here, and the individuals, one, two, and four in there, and the empty sets. Okay. Now, if you're like me, a long string of subsets like this does not speak to you. So what you think of is not in terms of the subsets, but in terms of what's called a geometric realization. So a geometric realization, Places each face with an appropriate tetrahedron of whatever dimension is needed. Tetrahedron, tetrahedrons are also called in this neck of the woods simplices. So that's why it's a simplicial complex, many simplices pasted together. So I claim that this is has this nice following geometric realization. So notice, I have the triangle 1, 2, 4 for that. I have the triangle 1, 3, 4 for this. I have each of these guys as edges, right? 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, etc. I have each of these guys as vertices. And of course, you don't see the empty face, but you usually don't see the empty face. <laughs> Questions about this? OK, so I'm now going to talk about dimension for these guys. <coughs> So realization is a triangulation in this sense. Uh, in some sense, of course, you could use hot, right. I could I could be using simplices, you know, solid tetrahedra, or if you can imagine what's in four space, that's fine too. Or, but yeah, it's uh, in two dimensions. You could basically think of triangulations. This is generalization of triangulations. Yes, 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 yes. This is a generalization of triangulations. Very good. Talk about increasing simplicity of complexes. Yes, that's that's what we're. So the question is going to be, what is the analog of an increasing forest for a simplicial complex? That's where we're going. So the cat is out of the bag. I'm trying at least have you enjoy the, the chase. Other questions. Okay, so I need to talk a little bit about dimensions of these guys. So. If sigma is a face of delta, then the dimension of sigma is just the number of elements in sigma minus one. Right? Because think about it. If I take this face, what do I want the dimension of that to be? Two. Two, right? Because it's a triangle and it's one less than the number of vertices. It's always this opposite. A facet of delta is a maximal sigmax. Okay, so what are the facets here? One, two, four, one, three. Exactly, the two triangles. So here the facets are. And then we'll say that delta is pure of dimension D if the dimension of phi is D for all facets. So there's nothing that says that just because the face is maximal that it has maximum dimension. But if they, all the max, maximal things all have maximum dimension, then it's pure. This is clearly. And we write this as dim of the simplicial complex is equal to So this thing has dimension. OK. So we're just going to now, by fiat, just look at pure things. So all our delta. Note, if I'm looking at the case d equals, sorry, 1, what am I recovering? Dimension equals 
on one key on a graph. So it goes, right? right? Everything is either a vertex or an edge. That's a graph. Graph without isolated vertices? Without isolated vertices, yes. But it's certainly a graph. A graph without isolated vertices is a graph. You can, and you can, by doing non-pure stuff, you can. But those isolated vertices, there's not much to study with them. So you could affect them. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, I don't think we're missing much for us. Or isolated vertices. The isolated vertices may not think that. <laughs> OK, so um, great. So now what I want to talk about is, right, so what does it mean to be a tree or a forest? So the definition here is that delta is a forest if the d-dimensional homology, d being this highest dimension, Now, if you know about homology groups, this makes a lot of sense because if D is the highest dimension, then there is, right? Remember, homology is boundaries, sorry, cycles versus modulo boundaries. But if you're in highest dimension, there are no boundaries. So you're just looking at the cycle structure, and this is saying we don't have any cycles. Now, if you're not comfortable with algebraic topology, then this is a lousy definition. So let me give you a more combinatorial definition, which is the one we're actually going to need for the increasing form. For this we need so the showing off, basically. We're showing off. We, we, we don't need no sleep in the long We can get away with no homology at all. Good. Should not apply. If it comes to the door, say we gave it the office. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So we're going to look at what's called a ridge. So a ridge uh, actually before I do that, I need to do the following. We need to go back and look at the graph case just a little bit more finely because there's something important here. So we need the following proposition for graphs. So as usual, let G have vertex set. And, and I claim that G, or let's call it an F, F is an increasing forest if and only if, so this is going to be an excluded subgraph criterion. We never have a subgraph I, K, J, two, two edges coming together, where the point where they come together is bigger than the two endpoints. Notice this is very nice, not because this is actually two conditions, right? Increasing and forced, this is only one. If you can't find a subgraph like that, it's an increase. It is both increasing and a forest. Let me give you a sense of why this is true by giving you a proof sketch of this direction. So let me first prove the forest. So to show G as a forest, how are you defining the question? I'm sorry, what? How are you defining? How do you find increasing in the setting of confidence? We haven't yet, but this, this, is, this is being used for motivation. We're going to get there. Okay. But before we get there, I want to go back to the graph case and make sure you see the important part of the graph case. Other questions? So to show to you as a forest, suppose towards a contradiction, that it has a cycle. Well, now let's look at the maximum vertex on that cycle. Right? Got a bunch of vertices, take the bar. What does that say about C? Well, it means C looks like this. Here's its maximum vertex. And here are two vertices on the other side. And then it, can, right, it continues on. Yeah, but what do we know? This is the maximum vertex, so this is bigger than both of these guys. And that is now sitting inside G. And that's exactly oops, F. And this is exactly what I said couldn't sit inside F. Right? To get the increasing is similar, but this should give you enough faith in this proposition. Okay, so how do we make how do we make this into some plus complex land? It's by the following. Uh, 
definition is we say that rho is a ridge of delta if the dimension of rho is d minus 1, where d, as usual, is the dimension of delta itself. So facets, maximum dimension, ridges, one less. And now we need a little bit of notation. We're going to write for any simplex in delta and vertex k, sigma less than k means that the maximum vertex in sigma is smaller than k. Equivalent, it means all vertices of kick sigma are less than k, because if the maximum is less than k, everything else is. So now we say that a ridge rho is caged if, OK, so right rho in the following sense. So this is saying rho consists of a maximum vertex k and then all the vertices less than k, which I'm calling sigma. So it's caged if there are facets b1 and b2 <coughs> with the following property. b1 can be written as sigma less than i less than k. And phi 2 can be written as sigma less than j less than k. So what it's saying is I can take this ridge and I can interpose a new vertex between the maximum vertex and whatever's coming after it in two different ways. Let's see what this means in this example. I claim here that the ridge consisting of 1, 4 is caged. Why? Exactly. We have 1, 2, 4 as my phi 1, and my 1, 3, 4 as my phi 2. Right? Put in two different numbers between the 1 and the 4. I claim that rho, which is equal to the edge 1, 2, is not caged. Why? There's always a one. Yeah, it's only one. It's only one higher simplex. It can't. If you need two, right? Um, and you can in one facet. Now think about it. Let's go back. Base <coughs> d equals two gives us graphs. What does this caged thing say? So in a graph G. First of all, what are the ridges in a graph G? Vertices. Vertices, right? So a ridge consisting of a single vertex is caged, means that there are facets, namely edges, that look like what? Well, I can put two things smaller than K. So I have an I, which is less than K, and I have a J, which is less than K. And this is saying that this is some sitting in our graph. But we've just seen that having them not sit in our graph is exactly what it means to be an increase in importance. So define so call uh, our simplicial complex delta cage free. I would like to know this is a very EC concept, right? We're only dealing with cage-free, right? And, and grain-fed and all sorts of it. Cage-free if it contains no caged ridges. And then we can do everything we've done up to now with our increasing forests replaced by cage free. There's analogs of all of the stuff that I told you. So HMS have analogs of all of the theorems where K 
cage free replaces increasing thrust. How many minutes do I have, if any? 0 0.5. Uh, I was going to tell you about uh, various open problems, but I think I'm going to run out of time before that happens. So I think I will just call it a day there. And thank you so much for listening and for all those questions. Thank you.